So our next presentation is going to be um, from Mason King, who is joining us from UC Berkeley. Uh, Mason, the floor is yours when you're ready. Thank you very much. Um, first, I just want to thank the organizers of this week's forum for inviting me to speak. Uh, the research that I'm presenting today is based on a year's fellowship with the University of California Carbon Neutrality Initiative in collaboration with Dr. Barbara Haya to assess the quality of power offset methodologies for clean water projects in East Africa. Oops. So the goal of this presentation is to first introduce carbon offsets in the voluntary offset market through the context of UC's carbon neutrality initiative. Um, I'm going to introduce the principal components of our quality assessment that we use to identify clean water carbon offset projects. Um, and then specifically discuss the preliminary results that we've calculated for community borehole maintenance and repair projects. Um, while the quality assessment considers a wide range of important factors, for the sake of time and interest of this forum, I'm going to highlight just two areas that are specifically relevant for community borehole projects, which are additionality and baseline conservativeness. So UC's Carbon Neutrality Initiative was initiated in 2013 under the direct of uh, President Janet Napolitano. And the goal of CNI is to eventually reduce greenhouse gas emissions from all 10 UC campuses to net zero by 2050. Along the way, UC has set interim goals, including reducing emissions to below 1990 levels by 2020 and net zero operational emissions by 2025. In particular, the 2025 goal is set to reduce all emissions that are associated with scopes one and two, which include direct emissions and purchased electricity. So in part of achieving our 2025 carbon neutrality goal, UC expects to procure carbon offsets. Um, mostly these offset procurements are needed because of the campus's reliance on methane combustion, uh, which is used to uh, generate electricity and heat um, across all the UC campuses. And so UC's current draft policy on the use of carbon offsets stresses the fact that offsets are an interim emissions reduction strategy, while the UC system is planning for the extensive capital investments that are going to be necessary to um, move away from natural gas to a more sustainable energy source. Um, UC is also committed to purchasing only high quality offsets, meaning that each carbon credit is, is equivalently representative of, of one ton of CO2 equivalents reduced. Um, there are currently two sources of credits that UC is considering. The first is UC initiated projects of which there are 12 pilot scale projects currently in development. And the second is procurement from the voluntary uh, offset market. And I just want to put a, throw a pitch out there for an upcoming presentation from two of the researchers in um, Professor Sang Wan's group at UC Santa Barbara that will talk about one of the, the 12 uh, UC initiated projects. Um, so the carbon uh, offset voluntary market is predominantly served by four major registries. I've bolded gold standard because it's the only registry that has currently developed a method for clean water project types. And so our quality assessment was performed on credits issued under their methodology. Um, gold standard issues methodologies, which set, sets out a specific criteria for registering a project and detailed instructions for how to um, calculate emissions reductions. However, um, there's still significant uncertainty in the actual emissions reductions achieved. Um, by an offset project, mostly due to the fact that it's impossible to exactly quantify um, the amount of emissions reductions that occur in a counterfactual baseline scenario. So to further reduce this uncertainty and to identify high quality offsets, we perform our own quality assessment, relying on peer reviewed literature and discussions with relevant actors in the field, um, followed by our own peer review process in the end. Um, so we first identified clean water carbon offset projects as a potential source of high quality offsets, specifically for community borehole maintenance and repair projects. We found that over 3.5 million offsets have been issued since 2013, that the number of projects generating credits is large, and that the number of new projects registered is continuing to rise. Um, community borehole projects generate credits by displacing wood fuel burning. Um, which is used for water purification if there is no source of clean water in the community. 
Um, all projects are currently located in Africa. And as I mentioned before, all projects are registered with gold standard and they apply the technologies and practices to displace decentralized thermal energy consumption methodology or the TPDDTEC methodology, which is a mouthful. And uh, I'm gonna refrain from using that from here on out. Um, so I'll just refer to that as the methodology. Um, the map to the right is color coded to correspond to the density of projects of community borehole projects per country. So for example, um, Eritrea here has uh, 33 projects currently registered and issuing credits, whereas uh, Sierra Leone and, and Senegal in, in West Africa um, each have one project, uh, which were added just this past year, and they have uh, yet to issue uh, any credits. So boreholes are an important source of water for the communities that are served by these projects. The figures to the right were taken from a project design document published in Gold Standard for a community borehole project in the Dukla district of Uganda. Um, just from the visual appearance of the hand dug open wells shown in figure A, it's, it's pretty apparent that these water sources have a high risk of contamination. So the maintenance and repair of community boreholes, such as the one that's depicted in figure B, um, helps to maintain the borehole functionality and mitigate against um, the community uh, reverting back to the use of um, uh, less developed uh, water sources. Um, so, there are a number of factors that we've considered in this assessment, but as I mentioned today, I'm gonna to focus on just two significant criteria that need to be met to, to ensure that high quality offsets uh, are issued. Uh, additionality is the idea that emissions reductions achieved by the project are uniquely a result of the efforts of that offset project, and that if the project had not occurred, the emissions reductions would not likely have been achieved. As I mentioned earlier, the baseline emission scenario is inherently difficult to quantify, and so it is extremely important that any assumptions used uh, in calculating the baseline emissions reductions um, are conservative um, and exact or certain whenever possible. So first we'll look at additionality. Um, the main issue here is that under the methodology, all borehole projects are automatically considered to be additional and they don't have to provide any evidence during the project validation phase to prove that. The reason for excluding criteria on additionality is to limit the burden on project developers uh, and to hopefully inspire investment in this project type. Unfortunately, this means that we don't have any evidence from the project documents that informs us on the true additionality of these projects. So we relied on a review of the water sanitation and hygiene or wash literature and discussions with some local NGOs doing work related to improved water sources in Africa. Um, and we use this information to assess additionality. So although borehole's useful lifetime is expected to be around 15 years, um, depending on the model, uh, one NGO representative told us that preventative maintenance is needed yearly, if not more frequently. And the report published in 2013 by the Rural Water Supply Network found that at any point in time, approximately 30% of hand pumps in Sub-Saharan Africa are non-functional. Additionally, we found from a case study in Malawi published last year that wash interventions are often obstructed by the loss of access to improved water sources over time. And that's most often correlated with inadequate preventative maintenance. So from this information, we felt comfortable to conclude preliminarily that borehole maintenance and repair projects are additional and they help to provide the funds and organizational structure that's necessary to maintain borehole functionality. Um, however, we particularly welcome any feedback from listeners today who um, may have any information um, or suggestions on resources that can help us to uh, improve our additionality assessment going forward. So the baseline assessment for community borehole projects has proven to be a bit more nuanced. Uh, rather than rely on actual baseline emissions calculations, the gold standard methodology allows for the use of a suppressed demand baseline. Um, suppressed demand is appropriate when the baseline is no source of electricity or no source of clean water. In such a case, uh, the baseline used is a minimum standard of living. So for 
community borehole project specifically, the baseline is 10 minutes of water boiling uh, using locally representative fuel and cooking conditions uh, to achieve sufficiently purified water. The idea of suppressed demand makes perfect sense from an equity perspective because it helps to inspire project development in communities that haven't traditionally benefited from car offsets, but um, would be particularly would particularly benefit from from having um, the funds generated from carbon offset projects directed into their community. Um, however, the issue from a carbon accounting perspective is that the hypothetical baseline may be significantly overestimating the actual baseline emissions and therefore leading to overcrediting. Um, suppressed demand for community borehole projects equates to the assumption that every community member served by the borehole was previously boiling water, water for drinking, cooking, and basic hygiene. And so we have a pretty good reason to believe that this is not a conservative assumption and that we need to check this. But before going on with the over and under crediting assessment, I think it's important to dive a little deeper into suppressed demand because it's actually one of the main reasons that make community borehole carbon offset projects extremely attractive for institutional buyers like UC who would like to offset emissions and also invest in projects that have the potential to significantly improve uh, human health and the quality of life of the individuals served by those projects. So this figure is certainly not surprising, but serves as a, as a reminder of the responsibility that different regions of the world have in causing and, then, and therefore combating climate change. It's striking and probably more appropriately horrifying uh, to consider the fact that the East Africa region this past year and historically has been among the lowest carbon dioxide polluters per capita, and yet stands to suffer some of the most significant consequences of climate change. So with this equity and moral argument in mind, it seems more than fair that carbon offsets can and should be directed to benefit these regions. And so when an institution like UC is considering where and how to invest in projects that have real climate benefit, a suppressed demand baseline can be an important signifier that the co-benefits of that project are likely tremendous. Um, still, if suppressed demand does lead to overcrediting, it's important to understand by how much. Um, to resolve this contradiction, we use an over and under crediting assessment to determine the proportion of credits um, that represent real emissions reductions. And if we find that one credit is actually equivalent to only a fraction of one ton of CO2 equivalents reduced, uh, we believe it's also appropriate for institutions to discount credits at a proportional rate. So for example, UC could purchase 10 credits and then only count five toward its carbon neutrality goal. Um, in this way, UC is sure that its purchases are leading to real emissions reductions while also supporting the most valuable project development it can. Um, after reviewing the full methodology and also considering the ways in which um, project developers make assumptions when implementing the methodology, we identified three major sources of overcrediting and three major sources of undercrediting. For each source of over and under crediting, we also identified alternative values from peer reviewed literature or survey data that we can then use to modify the standard carbon offset calculation to recalculate um, a, a theoretical number of carbon credits that could have been generated for each project. So as previously mentioned, the suppressed demand baseline is a source of over crediting. Uh, additionally, um, only CO2 emissions from the fraction of biomass that is considered to be non-renewable um, is credited for emissions reductions under this methodology. And we found that the default uh, NRB or, or non-renewable biomass values that project developers uh, were using were significantly larger than uh, what the scientific literature assumed NRB to be in these regions. Um, lastly, the massive wood fuel that's consumed to boil one liter of water, um, we believe is an unrealistic estimate of the actual wood fuel consumed. So those are the sources of overcrediting. And then for undercrediting, we found that um, clean water projects are actually only allowed to issue a maximum of 10,000 credits per year. Um, and so any additional credits that are generated over that 10,000 cap uh, don't get counted and, and are not issued. And so this is actually a built-in mechanism of conservativeness, um, but it's also a source of undercrediting. So we count for that. Um, 
Lastly, we attempt to account for the black carbon and organic carbon emissions um, by estimating the mass of, of black carbon and organic carbon that are emitted from wood fuel combustion um, using unimproved cook stoves in the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, GWP values for black carbon and organic carbon. And I, I guess lastly, uh, we consider the GWP 20 uh, year time horizon as a potential source of undercrediting. Um, so we look at that as well. So this figure shows the percent of credits that represent real emissions reductions for community uh, borehole projects in Eritrea in orange and Uganda in blue. And so when the bar is larger than 100%, as is the case for the 10,000 ton cap, it signifies that the parameter is a source of under, um, under crediting. And when the bar is less than 100%, it signifies that the parameter is a source of over crediting. I wanted to highlight the last two columns, specifically the adjusted baseline and the black carbon and organic carbon at GWP 100. Um, when the baseline is adjusted to actual rates of water boiling, we see that only about 45% of the credits issued um, in Eritrea are real, and that number drops down even further for Uganda um, to about uh, just over 20%. So this essentially highlights uh, the important finding that suppressed demand doesn't actually uh, ref reflect baseline water boiling. Um, However, when we do take into account the black carbon and organic carbon emissions that are associated with wood fuel burning, we find that the credits issued are significantly undercrediting actual emissions. And so these, the black carbon, organic carbon, and also the GWP20 um, can be ways to think about carbon offsets um, that can uh, help to make up for the uh, overcrediting that's associated with suppressed demand. So we've performed our over and under crediting assessment for all community borehole projects that are currently issuing credits in Eritrea, Ethiopia, Malawi, and Uganda. And in this figure, I've highlighted a few results from the assessment when we applied it to Eritrea. Um, the results in this figure take into account adjustments for all the sources of over and under crediting that I mentioned previously. And the bars on the left side of the graph represent the scenario when the 100 year GWP um, is used for all greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it's delineated with respect to including black carbon um, or not including black carbon, which is the black carbon is the, the black and not black carbon is the blue. So the, the bars on the right side of the graph represent the same scenario, but for the 20 year GWP uh, values for all the greenhouse gas gases that are emitted. And we find that when we use the GWP 20, uh, climate impacts, um, as well as uh, include the black carbon emissions, nearly 100% of the credits that have been issued from these projects um, in Eritrea are real. Um, and so some of the next steps forward for this project type include developing a UC policy on the consideration of black carbon and GWP20 uh, to assess the quality of carbon offsets. Uh, in conclusion, I just want to highlight four significant insights that we've learned from this assessment and offer a few comments on the ways that we think it can be improved. So the first is that we've preliminarily determined that the additionality for community borehole projects is good um, from peer-reviewed articles and discussions with NGOs. Um, however, this additionality assessment could be significantly improved after discussing with more relevant stakeholders, such as people... <clears throat> Uh, who have experience designing, building, maintaining, or of course using boreholes in Africa. Um, so we particularly welcome any feedback that um, listeners today may have um, with ways to approach this, the next steps in additionality assessment. Um, the second is that our quality assessment currently relies on survey data from project developers, which we believe could be biased in some cases, um, uh, just from the fact that it's coming from project developers that have the incentive um, to um, generate more credits uh, or from 
demographic and health survey data, which is imprecise in that from that data, we're, we're only able to calculate a national rate of water boiling. And so we can't uh, be more precise uh, in determining actually what the actual baseline uh, water boiling practices uh, were like in the communities where these borehole projects um, are, are located. Uh, the third is that if we accept the 20 year GWP uh, values for greenhouse gas emissions, and we also account for black carbon emissions reductions, we find that the credits issued from uh, some projects in some countries represent uh, real emissions reductions. So today I showed some preliminary results for uh, projects in Eritrea, and the next steps in our quality assessment are to apply this over and under crediting assessment to all projects currently issuing credits in Africa. And to do this, we've requested baseline survey data from Gold Standard uh, that will help us to delineate the real baseline uh, from that suppressed demand one. And finally, UC's approach uh, to evaluating carbon offset quality shows how institutional climate goals uh, that prioritize both high quality offsets and equity can incentivize investment in offset projects like community boreholes that have uh, very high societal benefit. So I just wanted to acknowledge my advisor, Dr. Barbara Haya, for her support through this and thank the University of California Carbon Neutrality Initiative for the fellowship um, references. And please get in contact uh, with either myself, uh, Barbara Haya, or both of us. Uh, and we'd love to hear uh, your thoughts um, and welcome any questions in the upcoming, upcoming panel discussion. Thank you so much. <laughs>